بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي سلام everybody السلام عليكم welcome i'm so happy you're here so we're just going to jump right into it because we actually need like every, as much time as i can get today inshallah so um for the last now as far as i understand few hundred years of the muslim umma Islam, not Islam itself, but the Ummah itself, the people of Islam, Muslims, have been in winter for the last few hundred years. Not just the last hundred years where we lost our last empire, but the last few hundred years, because even towards the end of that empire, things were kind of going wrong, yes? As, our, as, as we see in our history. The thing about winter, you know, for example, we're entering winter right now. What happens in winter? What do things do? What do, what do the trees do in winter? It's not that hard. What do trees do in winter? They die. they die. But winter is not necessarily just death. Because what happens under the soil during winter? What happens to the seeds? It's more actually of a hibernation than it is of a death. Because while the trees, some of them might die, may, may die off, underneath the soil, some seeds are left over and then it's waiting for spring. And when spring comes, the light comes, the water comes, and everything regrows anew. It's become very clear to me, especially with recent events happening in Gaza, Palestine and elsewhere, that we are towards the end or maybe even already in the beginning. We're either towards the end of our winter as an ummah or we're already in the spring. Am I making sense? We're either towards the end of the, the downfall we've been seeing or we're already starting with the spring in terms of our faith. Yeah. And we know that as soon as the spring comes, we're going to see a revitalization of the Muslim Ummah, of not just our faith, but even of our community, of our nation and everything, yeah? We've been dealing with a lot for the last few hundred years of our people have been dealing with, and by our people, I don't mean Palestine or Pakistan or Egypt, no, I'm talking about Muslims. Muslims, our people, meaning Muslims, have been dealing with colonization, losing their homes, losing their lives, losing their religion, not only colonization of their land, but colonization of what? Their minds. Now we want to think like everyone else thinks and that, that made us dumb. We, we left our religion. But that now has been put, as I'm seeing at least even on, even on Twitter, even on TikTok, I'm seeing that being put way to the side. People are tired of this. And Muslims are now waking up, which is what I mean. This is what I mean by the spring of the ummah. And it's because faith has now like these seeds that Allah implanted in our hearts, they're now seeing the light, they're now receiving the water and they're starting to what? starting to bud and grow. And I want to actually take this a little bit further in terms of like well, how we understand faith, yeah? I want you to envision a bunch of trees standing together, kind of like a fort, like a fort, basically a mini forest where trees are standing firm together. Have you ever actually, before I get to that, have you ever, uh, after like a storm, even where we live in, in like suburbs of Chicago, when a heavy storm happens and you drive down the street, sometimes you'll notice an entire tree, sometimes even huge like oaks, will be completely uprooted. Have you seen this before? Like, mashallah, that was a really crazy storm. This whole tree, I, at least every year, we see like one big tree that everyone talks about that gets uprooted, yeah? And it's not that the tree broke physically, like the trunk, because the trunk's super firm, but literally it got plucked off the ground. You've seen this before? And then if you go and look, if you go like afterwards, and sometimes it's even farther away than where it was before, you'll see it's either one of two reasons why that tree got completely uprooted. Either the roots were super weak, maybe they were damaged from water, maybe they didn't go, or, or they, were, they were weak or damaged, or they were super short. Because if they were strong and deep, they would hold on to the earth, because that's really what's holding a tree down, isn't the trunk? The trunk is actually a weight that's working against the tree. But the roots are holding firm into the earth, so even if something wants, like sometimes you see a tree in the wind, it wants to fly away. You've seen that before? It's basically a huge umbrella. Of course it wants, it's a big parachute, of course it wants to fly away. But what's holding it is what? Not the trunk, not the leaves, the roots. And I want to keep this image in mind. The roots are what keep a plant or a tree firm in the ground, yes? I want you to now go back to that forest example that I said a little bit earlier. When a bunch of trees are in a forest, here's my lame drawing of this. I want you to pay attention, thank you so much. I worked really hard. You know, I literally, it took me like 10 minutes to get this right tree. Half the lecture time was just getting this tree. <laughs> I spent hours on this. Most of it was just this tree. So these are my trees. Um, I'm really bad at PowerPoint. Here are my trees. I want you to focus on these guys right here. These guys are firm. They're, they're standing together. Whenever you see a tree unrooted or un, like you know, plucked out the ground, 
it's rarely these guys. Which trees get unplucked? The ones that stand by themselves because they have nothing to support. These trees, even physically, like I'm talking about real world, like physics, like how plants work, how trees work, these roots do not run very deep. They don't run very deep. They don't have to. Why don't they have to? Because they're standing together. And I want you now to envision, what am I really talking about? I'm talking about people's hearts. I'm talking about Muslims. Muslims in other countries, like if when they go to work, everyone takes a break for Salah. When they go to work and it's Friday, does, does anyone not go to Jama'ah? No, everyone goes to Jama'ah. If you're walking in the streets and a man, Palestine, wherever other Muslim countries, everyone wears hijab. It's actually hard not to be Muslim in these other countries. Does that make sense? So these trees, they don't have very deep roots, but do they need deep roots? No. Have you ever been to Umrah? Anyone here been to Umrah or Hajj? Raise your hand. Can you stand up for a second? Thank you. Lock arms with me. So in Umrah or Hajj, people are wild. I stand over here. People are wild in Umrah Hajj. Who's been? Raise your hand. Are people not insane, subhanAllah? Muslims are awesome. So. When you want to go close to the Kaaba, you need to lock arms, like try to hurt me. Okay. You need to interlock. And then one time I literally saw some, like uh, these, like a group of women trying to interlock. And then one got like taken like, like from a, like in a sea and they're like, no. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate you. So when you lock together, it's harder to be taken away by a storm. You following me? And here's my turn. This also actually took me longer than the trees. Wallah. The tornado was especially hard to get. It's a really crappy tornado too. But I'm kind of proud of it. Look at it. Anyway, now when the tornado, when the storm comes, these guys are safe. Why are these safe again? Someone say out loud, why are these guys safe? Because they're interlocked. What about this guy? Is he safe? What does he need? Because he's like every other tree. What does this tree need to survive this storm? Yeah, he's not going to change up here. He needs to change down here. He needs to be special. His roots need to run much deeper, twice as deep, three times as deep as any of these guys. And I want to talk about this because when you look at people at Gaza right now, for example, I know you guys are all watching videos with me. I know it's hard to look, keep an eye, keep your eye away. And they, wallahi, don't get me wrong, they are this and together. So, wallahi, don't even get it twisted. They are literally this and they're deeper than this and they're all together. So they're both, mashallah. That's why Allah chose them to be an example for the rest of Muslims, yeah? For the rest of the world, not even just the rest of Muslims, the rest of the entire world. They right now, Allah chose Gaza to be a light for everybody else, yeah? But us in America, we have a unique situation. When I go to work, my boss is not Muslim. When I go to work, it's hard to go to Jama'ah. When I go to work, I have to find a nursery room, a mother's to, to pray, a nursing room to pray. You have to go out of your way. You might get made fun of, you might get harassed. Praying in an airport is a dice roll. You know what I mean? It's harder here. So you, can, we, you and I are in a unique situation. Allah put you and I in a very unique situation. A lot of us are asking, well, what's my role to play with Gaza? Here's your role. You need to get your roots deep in faith, deep. And what does this, guys? Quran. The only thing that can make your roots run deep is Quran. No Quran, no roots. No roots, forget about your Islam. No roots, any storm can come. And by the way, Gaza right now is this thing, but even before Gaza, did you not have personal things that were challenging you? Did you not have personal things? Did you not have things that challenged your faith that you saw on YouTube or that you saw from a friend or things of, like from your own thoughts even? Your own sins even? Absolutely. Gaza is just another tornado on top of your, your ordinary life. If any one of these things come, it's so easy to pluck you out. Because you, if, if you and I even have this, we're not gonna survive a storm. So you and I need a special awareness on how, how deep our Iman goes. And this is what I wanna spend time on for the rest of Tanzian. I'm seeing a lot of new faces. Last month at Tanzian, when I had the opportunity to speak, I told you I don't have a curriculum. I don't have a plan. I'm just gonna talk about things out of Quran that I thought were cool. I threw that completely out the window when the first bombs dropped last month. Actually, the day I first spoke was October 7th, subhanAllah. So the day this stuff started. So my mind about this opportunity of mine completely, I shifted it, I threw that out the window. We are now going to talk about, and have to, have to awkwardly go back, believing in the Quran. And I mean that in two different ways. Number one, do you even believe in Quran? That's number one, do you even believe it? That's the first thing I wanna talk about. And the second thing is, what does it mean to believe as per the Quran? What is faith? How do you grow it? How do you become this? How do you become like the little girl in Gaza that she's bombed? Literally, there's a video like this. 
bombed all through the night and in the morning, her back is against a charred car and she's reading Quran. <laughs> or like the little five-year-old kid on an incubator saying Allahu Akbar half conscious. Would you say Allahu Akbar half conscious? Would I? I probably wouldn't. These people, by the way, I wanna, I wanna call something out, it's interesting. Have you seen the TikTok trend of people converting? And you, raise your hand if you notice this with me. The most famous one that's getting on the news today was Megan Rice, my, my mom just sent me a video. Megan Rice, have you been following Megan Rice? These young men and women, previously atheists, previously Jews even, previously Christian, previously whatever, they literally are going back to Quran because they see Muslims and they're like, what is this? This is wild. Even Christians that were Christians for 60 years of their life are like, I've never seen people who have believe in God like this. What is this? And it all goes back to what? They literally buy a Quran and they're doing better than you and I on TikTok, on TikTok. What about us? Do we have any relationship with this thing? Do, did we have an aha moment with Quran that like, I believe this is definitely the word of God like they do? Do we really? This is what I wanna cover for the next few months. For the first four sessions, including this week, and I'm speaking alhamdulillah two weeks in a row, this week and next week, we're gonna talk about first miracles of the book, miracles of Quran. I want everyone to have their aha moment. I had moments basically, and I'm nobody, wallahi, like they say ustad on the thing. I'm just a guy, some guy, Shadi Jabali. But I've had moments in myself where I learned something about Quran and I literally, I'm just like, you know, I get it, I just make sujood. Like, I don't know what else to do. Like, I get it, Ya Allah, I believe. And even I'll have things in my life that make me question my faith, but then I'm like, yeah, but the Quran though, it becomes my root. You cannot take me off my anchor. Does that make sense? I wanna share these things with you because they exist, but we just don't know what they are. And it's so silly to me, so stupid to me, we don't know what they are. And I'm not saying I'm gonna give you that moment, I'm saying I'm gonna try. You, everyone has their own journey, you have to do things on your own, but I'm gonna try to give you at least what helped me out, inshallah, okay? So, what do I have next? I want us to agree on a few things about Quran really quickly. In fact, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. So let me just, a couple of things I want to talk about. So eyes on me, not on the board, yeah? Eyes on me, please. Don't look at the board. A couple of things about Quran that we need to remind ourselves on or else what I'm going to say won't be as impactful. So if you want the next hour to be worth it, pay attention to this minute, this two minutes, inshallah. Number one, unlike many other religious books, we believe Quran is the verbatim word of Allah. It's not some guy who was inspired and then wrote in his own words. We believe that like when Allah says Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, it's Him saying what? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, exactly. That's are His words, not anyone else's. Does that make sense? We're ver that's what verbatim means. Verbatim, it's one for one, His words, okay? Next, we know is revealed 1400 years ago. Keep that in mind because it's old. Uh, it's preserved. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but rest assured, we believe that Quran, and we know actually for a fact, Quran is the same Quran revealed that long ago. One quick you know, even um, kind of uh, thinking exercise for you, mental exercise. If you were to completely obliterate, burn, throw in the ocean, otherwise delete if it's a website, every single book in the world or any written thing ever, even if something's written on the wall, you get rid of it. So there's no more writing in, in history, no more writing in the world. Can you envision a world like that? We just decimated all writing. Can you bring back any other book other than the Quran the way it was before? No, because no one memorized Shakespeare, no one memorized the textbook, no one memorized the Bible, even for example, the Torah, no one memorized the Talmud, no one memorizes any of this stuff. But the Quran, all you need to do is get a kid from China, a kid from Zimbabwe, a kid from the US, a kid from wherever the heck you want to bring a kid from, that's a Hafid, we have millions of them, get them from anywhere you want, put them on a Zoom call, they don't have to speak the same language, just say Bismillah and get them started. How much time do you want to give it? 15 hours, 24 hours, how many do you want to give them? Within 24 hours, the Quran will be back exactly the way it was before. Because there is no variation. What was given to the Prophet and we have exactly. So just to get that out of your heads. These last three though, I'm gonna focus on a lot for the next two weeks. This one, the 114, I'm gonna focus on next week. But just to quickly go over it, Quran was revealed piecemeal. Meaning it wasn't like Muhammad from day one, here's the book, go say it to people. We don't believe that. We also don't believe that Quran was revealed in the final order that we have it now. So Quran was not revealed chapter one, then chapter two, then chapter three, then you following me? It wasn't revealed Fatiha, then Baqarah, then Ali Imran, then Nisa, then Ma'idah, then blah, blah, blah. No, it was revealed in pieces. And then at the end of it, we got the final order of it. Okay, we're gonna talk about that next week. I don't wanna go into it too much now, but the last two, you need to pay attention, please. The last two, especially. The first one, it's an oral tradition. Oral meaning spoken. It is a spoken word. 
It's always been a spoken word. Quran even does not mean book. Quran means the recital, the grand recitation. Meaning it's purpose. The reason why you can bring it back if the book was destroyed is because it's a spoken thing, not a reading thing. Like we don't, like even these books, we call them mushafs. This is not what Quran is. But when I say Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, that's Quran because I'm reciting it. Does that make sense? Quran is only Quran when you recite it. Yes? So why is this important? Because if we're going to talk about miracle of Quran, we have to narrow our options down to mainly two. Are you listening? We have two options. Either you believe the Quran is the word of Allah, which I'm, I know everyone in the room, alhamdulillah, believes that, but I'm just, let me logically bring you through this, yeah? Either you believe it's the word of God himself, which means Allah gave it to Jibreel alayhi salam, the, arch, the archangel Gabriel, who recited it to who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who recited it to the world. Either you believe that happened, or if you're in this other camp, you don't believe in God, or you don't believe in this God, you don't believe in the angel, fine. So then who spoke it? If you don't believe in Allah, who spoke it? Huh? Yeah. If you, thank you for being the only person. If you don't believe, and really this is important guys, if you don't believe that the Prophet, that, Muhammad, that sorry, Allah is the one that revealed the Quran, who do you believe spoke the Quran? Everyone together. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They don't say it, but we say it, yes? These are your two options. Every other option I literally have even tried. I even went to Reddit for you guys, man. Disgusting. Poof, Reddit. I even went to Reddit for you people. Even Reddit couldn't come up with some theory about like, oh, it's multiple people. No, even when they say that, it's like vague. It's like it could have been. No, you really have, I'm forcing you to two options because every other option is so weak that really it's these two. Are you guys following that these two options? Either it's from who? Or it's from? Muhammad Meaning if it's from the Prophet it's a freestyle rap essentially. You guys know what I mean by freestyle rap? Because he just spoke these rhymes he never went back and edited it. He just said it, people memorized it, and they moved on. He wasn't like, I said, Alhamdulillahi, Rabbi, I said, Rahman, Rahim, I met Rahim, Rahman. Can we edit that? No. What he said is what, وسلم, is what happened, and then they moved on. Does that make sense? There was no editorial process, especially with verbal stuff. So those are the two options. And lastly, I'm going to talk about it being a miracle. What does it mean to have a miracle? We all know that Prophet stories all involve miracles. Musa salam, split the sea. Isa cured the, cured the blind all by the will of Allah. We know our miracle is what? The miracle of Muhammad is the Quran itself. Saleh for example, had he, he whatever split the rock and a camel, a live camel, a huge she camel came out of it. What is the purpose of these miracles? These miracles purpose, a lot of the time we got our attitude twisted where we think it's to bash other people over the head with it. Like, why don't you believe? Look at this miracle. That's not the purpose. It depends on who's receiving it. If you're a believer seeing a miracle, that miracle's purpose is to reaffirm your faith, reassure your heart. My proof of that is Ibrahim salam. When Ibrahim, in Quran, we know he had a conversation with Allah. Ya Allah, show me how you bring life back from the dead. Have you heard the story before? Ya Allah, show me, I want to see for myself, how do you bring life from the dead? And Allah asked them, Awalam tu'min, don't you already believe? And of course, he's, he's Ibrahim, he's the father of belief. Of course he believes. So he said, Bala, of course. Walakin inna qalbi. I just want to reaffirm my heart. So if, even if you already believe and you're already like in this, you're ride or die with Islam, this will still, inshallah, reaffirm you. And we, especially nowadays, we need this, yeah? What about the opposite end? If you're a kafir, and by kafir, I don't mean non-Muslim, I mean like a conscious denier of Islam, yes? A conscious denier of God. Then for you, it's actually not to affirm your heart, but to expose your heart. Like imagine you're sitting with your kafir homies in, like in Salah's time, and then you, you know, and the message makes sense, but I just don't like it. You know, I, I make too much money to give to the poor, whatever your reason, your psychological reason might be. And then you see a camel come out of a rock. What logical, how do you twist that exactly? Yes. At that point, every believer is looking at you like you're obviously something's wrong with you. Like for our own following Musa after he split the sea, what mental illness do you have that even this isn't enough? <laughs> you understand? It exposes them. And then finally with non-Muslims. Not kafir, but maybe ignorant or maybe doesn't know yet, yes? For these people, it's just to add weight to the message. The message is enough, but this adds weight, yes? That being said, we're gonna jump right in. Here's my plan for the next, remember, four, next four sessions, including today and next week. I'm gonna talk about miracles of Quran. I'm gonna split that up a court like this. The first two are gonna be about symmetry and structure of the Quran. 
I'm very giddy to talk to you about it. Well, I'm very excited. And I hope, Ya Allah, I pray that I can really like give this to you the way that I received it. I really hope I can, inshallah. Make da'a for me that I can do that. And then after that, we're gonna talk about certain passages in the book that will reaffirm and strengthen your heart. So Quran tackles the mind and it tackles the heart at the same time. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna reaffirm and grow our roots intellectually and through means of the heart. Does that make sense? But first we're gonna tackle the what? The mind. Can we convince ourselves? Let's do that together inshallah. We're gonna go through symmetry and structure, kind of this macro view of the book, this week and next week. On session three, which sometime next month, I forget the date, we're gonna go over precision of the Quran. Why does Allah use this word and not that word? Why did Allah use this tense, past tense and not present tense? So on and so forth. And then the final session of these four, we're gonna talk about uh, content and impact. What did the Quran do? What's the big deal about it? Why do people love it so much? What did it do to people? Does that make sense? So inshallah, that'll be good, uh, you know, uh, beneficial to you guys. After that, we're gonna go passage by passage and talk about things that really changed my life. And I don't mean that, I mean, literally, you cannot be the same person after learning certain passages of this book. You simply cannot be the same person. It's as if you put on glasses and you're like, I see the world differently. So I'm excited to go through that, but we're, that's not today's stuff. Okay, you guys feeling okay? That was a long intro. What time is it right now? 55? Jeez, man. I suck at this. I literally practice this. I still over 25 minutes. Okay. We got to go quickly now. So Bismillah. Um, in the physical world, do we see structure? Yeah. Do we see symmetry? Do we see design? There's actually this really interesting hashtag on Twitter, if you're on, or X, whatever they call it, X. There's this really cool, I know it's stupid. Well, uh, on X, you see this hashtag actually called no design. One of this, if you don't follow this guy, follow him, Paul Williams. He's a Muslim from the UK. The whitest Muslim you'll ever see. I love him so much, Wallah. He's so smart. He never shares anything except that it's just gold. And he, has, he uses this hashtag a lot of like no design. Obviously he's being sarcastic. And then he'll be like, yeah, this is his only one, but like this is like a snowflake. You know, sometimes I'll post a leaf. Like, look at this. This looks like a city plan. It looks like streets for a suburb. And like the point of these veins is to carry chloroplast up so that it stays green and lively, subhanAllah. So it's not only beautiful, but it has a, a purpose. And that's the thing, by the way, about symmetry and structure in, in nature, is that it's both purpose and beauty, yes? It's not just pretty for the sake of being pretty. There's a purpose behind the pretty, yeah? Those two things. Anyway, we see it in even things that create, things create them with symmetry, like spiders. And even in like you cut a tree and you see the rings of a stump, you know? Even if you go as big as you want or as small as you want, you see even things orbiting around each other. Like the same way you and I do tawaf around the Kaaba, that we go around the Kaaba, you have electrons going around the negative charge, going around the positive charge of the nucleus. Or you have the earth around the sun and the sun around you know, something else, right? And then I, I was actually very curious, like in, you know how like Allah says everything makes tasbih, everything praises God, but you don't understand it? This is probably an Adam's tasbih. This is probably its tawaf. So then I'm like, if everything makes tasbih, what if it stops making tasbih? And I just Googled like, what happens if an electron stops rotating? Have you ever asked this question? Literally, look at this. Protons are dominant causing the collapse of matter. So if atoms stopped being structured, if an atom stopped doing tasbih, essentially everything would cease to exist, subhanAllah. We see this purposeful, beautiful structure and symmetry in our physical world that is undeniable. And for there to be a design, there must be a designer, but that's not today's conversation. Today's conversation is, is Quran also the creation of Allah? Yes or no? Yeah. It's not, the physical, it's not a physical creation, it's a spiritual creation, but it's still a creation. So does the Quran also have symmetry? Does it also have structure? Does it also have this beauty and purpose intertwined into one? That's what I wanna to talk to you about today. I don't wanna tell you what I'm doing yet, I wanna show you and then tell you, okay? So bismillah, and please stick with me. I already see people falling asleep. Just stick with me, please, yes? I need you, I told you in the group chat, if you're not on the Tenzia group chat, join it. I told you if you're not ready to think, don't come because I don't need anyone not thinking here, yeah? Even if it was only five of you, I need you paying attention, okay? I'm serious. Okay, miss that. The first, ex oh, I didn't explain yet. I'm gonna give you, we're gonna jump into Quran right now. I'm gonna give you six examples of symmetry and structure. These aren't the only six, these are just six that I picked, okay? The first two are examples of ayahs that have symmetry. Then we're gonna go into two small surahs that have symmetry. I'm defining small by a page or under. 
Then we're going to go into the last two are going to be medium-sized surahs that have symmetry. I'm going to define medium as over a page, under 15 pages, whatever. Let's pick that number. It's loose definitions, yes? We're not going to do anything big, like not bakara or anything like that. That's next week. This week we're just doing small stuff, okay? So we're going to start with the first ayah example. And the ayah example appropriately is kursi. This is the most important ayah of Quran. Who memorized kursi in the room? Charla? Very good, very good. Should be everybody. Everyone should memorize kursi. It's a very important one. But kursi is the most important. It's like people, scholars call it the crown of the Quran because it's purely about Allah. The only body in Quran that's more purely about Allah than kursi is what surah? Ikhlas, that's purely about Allah. But ayah wise, this is carrying the crown, yeah? You don't need to read this. This is kursi written out. Notice by the way that it takes a lot more words in English to translate words in Arabic, yeah? You notice that? It's interesting. Anyway, this is kursi. I don't need you to read that either. I'm gonna read it to you. This is the only one I'm gonna read to you. Everything else I need you to kind of try to catch up, yeah? So kursi is not one sentence. An ayah, by the way, does not follow rules. An ayah could be what Allah can make an ayah whatever he wants. He can make it a sentence or he can make it a bunch of sentences like here. He can make it a couple of letters or one letter like qaf. He can make it a word like ar-Rahman. He can make, do whatever he wants with an ayah. In this case, an ayah is a bunch of sentences. There's actually nine sentences here. And I actually don't want you to focus on the word sentence right now. Because each sentence, you'll notice that after each sentence, for example, God, there is nothing worthy of worship for him, the living, the high, uh, or the, in the maintainer of existence. He's talking about Allah and the two names. Then it goes into neither drowsiness nor sleep overtakes him. So it's not just a change in the sentence, it's a change of theme. The subject kind of changed. Does that make sense? Are you following me? So it's not really sentences, it's what? Themes. Keep that word in mind. When a theme changes, the sentence also changes. Anyway. We're going to go one by one. I want you to try to find patterns on your own. Here's the first sentence, first theme. I'll use the word theme now. There are nine themes in Kursi. I'm going to read them one by one. Number one, the first theme. Allah, there is nothing worthy of worship except for Him, the living, the maintainer of existence. Al-Hayy Al-Qayyum. Neither sleep nor drowsiness overtakes Him. He owns whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. Who in the world is allowed to intercede except by his permission? Inter what does intercede mean? Intercede means that if I'm in trouble at work and my boss calls him like, Shadi, get over here. And my coworker is like, no, no, Shadi's a good guy. He helps me out all the time. That's called intercession. I'm trying to make you look good in front of the boss. That's intercession. Who can do that in front of Allah except by Allah's permission? He knows what is in front of them and whatever is behind them. He's, his knowledge is all encompassing. And they, by contrast, do not encompass anything of his knowledge except by his permission, except how he wills. And his throne extends over the heavens and the earth and preserving them too, does not, does not tire him, does not burden him. And he is Al-Ali and Al-Azim. He is the most high and he is the most stable, the great. You following so far? I'm gonna point out a few things and I wanna, we didn't get to the symmetry yet. Pay attention, everyone look at me and I want you to pay attention. I'm not going to go in detail because I don't want to run out of time. But if you read each of these themes, each line connects with the line before and the line after. Test it with anyone that you want. I'm going to give you an example. Neither drowsiness nor, nor sleep overtakes him. How does it connect with the line before? How can he be the ultimate maintainer if he gets tired? But even f first and foremost, the living. Do you know like in Islam, what do we think of sleep? It's a minor what? Death. death. So he cannot be overtaken by sleep because even minor death doesn't take him, let alone death itself. He's the ultimately living. You see how two, two connects with one? What about three? Whatever is in the heavens and the earth, uh, whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth is his. He gets the full right to own it. No one else can own it but him because he's the only one that can fully maintain it. He's the only one living and awake uh, permanently enough to actually own and call ownership of this creation of his. So you can test this with whatever line you want. There's already a connection happening here because every theme connects with the theme before and the theme after. But does anyone notice anything about this before I tell you? Did anyone notice anything about this? Go ahead. Like reverse, um, one Did you hear this before? 
You did. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. I'm not, I expected someone to you. I expected someone to you. But you're going to learn something new, so pay attention. She's right. Actually, before I go there, if you look at the first sentence, there are how many names of Allah shared? Two. The last sentence, how many names of Allah? Two. The second sentence, neither drowsiness nor sleep overtakes him. The second to last, the preservation does not burden him. You see the connection? Like there's no weakness. Each one is talking about negating any weakness of Allah. The third sentence, heavens and the earth. The third to last, his throne extends over the heaven and the earth. Weird. The fourth sentence, who could intercede except by his permission? The fourth to last, number six, they do not encompass anything of knowledge except what he wills, otherwise except by his permission. So are you seeing the pattern here that everything is mirroring each other, yeah? You see that? Raise your hand if you don't see it. You don't see it? You see it or yes? No or no? She does? Okay. Everything is matching each other. But what's cool is what's in the middle. The, even the middle is I know what's before and I know what's after. I know what's in front, I know what's behind. What? How does someone speak like this? Can I speak and I'm like, I got to make sure I say the middle part in the middle? That's wild to say nine sentences and make sure. Because remember, was this written down? This is a freestyle rap, man. How does someone freestyle this? But we're not done. What I'm going to do is a lot more to this. So pay even if you know this before, pay attention. Well, we're going to go deep with it. So uh, well, all I did here was I kind of indented them. So it's easier to see. You see what I did? So I put the A and then the last one is also A. You see, there's still the same words and everything, but I'm just connecting them with the letters. You see that? You guys still with me? I just don't want to scare you with all this movement on the slides, yeah? I'm going to call, by the way, this is going to be A, B, C, D, E. And after the center, I'm going to start using words like D prime, e, e, sorry, D prime, C prime, B prime, A prime. You might hear me say that. So if I say the letter A, Sam, I'm talking about the first A. If I say C prime, am I talking about the first or second C? Second, because prime comes at the end. Okay. I wish I color coded this for you guys. I did color code it for you guys. I did color code it. All right. This is so it makes it easier for your eyes. Yeah. Now listen, we, I said, I was like disappointed. And I'm like, I said, I got you. All right. So we already established before that by just to remind you that everything is like tied with what's before and after. Yes. But not only that, now we're seeing it's tied with its mirror image. This whole thing is so interconnected. And not only the interconnected, but like the middle is just, I mean, come on, for that to be the middle is a little bit on the nose, no? Well, he knows what's, uh, what's before and after, subhanAllah. But I wanna actually, there's a couple more things, ready? I want to call attention to the names being used. What are the first two names? I'm gonna put a box over them with magic. So if you look, the first two names in the first line, what are these names? al Hai and al and al Bayum, And the last two names are Al-Ali and Al-Azim. You'll notice something with them actually. Hai and Qayyum start with the same sound. Even if you don't speak Arabic, listen. Hai and Qay, sound similar or no? Same, same verb or same uh, um, vowel, you hear that? Al-Ali, Al-Azim, does that also start with the same letter, the same sound? But hold on, listen. al hai. Now if we compare this with this one, they don't start with the same, but what do they do? They end with the same. al hai and Al-Ali. And even here, Qayyum and Azim, what do they do? They end with the same sound. So up here, they start with the same sound. When you compare it with, with its sister, it starts with the same sound. When you juxtapose it against each other, they end with the same sound. How do you plan that out in your head? I want to give you a little bit more. By the way, just a little tip, because this is stuff you can literally find by yourself, Allahi. This is not like, you don't need a book to find this stuff. There are these things called anchors. Anchors, meaning when the same thing or similar things, similar sounding things are said close to each other, pay attention. For example, if you're reading and you're like, I read heavens and the earth, and then I again read heavens and the earth, there's definitely a connection there. That's called an anchor. Does that make sense? So whenever something is said similarly, go back to where you heard it the first time because you'll find a connection. Does that make sense? But anyway, what I'm going to show you next, actually, this is all my thoughts, so I might be wrong, but I'm actually very proud of this. I've been staring at this for like three weeks, getting this ready for you guys, and I found two by accident, two extra things I want to show you, two extra layers. 
So are you ready to go a, a, a layer deeper for the, with this, inshallah? Okay, I'm gonna draw lines that are gonna confuse and scare you, but I'm gonna hold your hand through it, okay? Relax, they're just lines. Okay, I wanna point out a couple things, ready? Actually, forget this thing, okay. All of these, let me start here. All of these sentences mention who? They all mention Allah one way or another. They either say he or his or him, you see that? Test it, every single one of them mention him. But is he the only one being mentioned? No, not in all of them. And some of them, he's the only one being mentioned. But in the rest of them, no, others are being mentioned. I'm gonna draw your attention, look where my fingers are, from D to D prime. Who else is being mentioned between these two lines? Who's they? Human beings, us. We, so we're being mentioned here, we're in the middle. How about C, the yellow ones? What else is being mentioned outside of Allah in these? The heavens and the earth. What about over here with, uh, where are we at, with B? What's similar between these is, I'm gonna summarize it as weakness. Burden, burden and fatigue, weakness. And who is surrounding all of it? Is anyone else mentioned in A or A prime? Nobody else. Meaning, let me make this simple for you. Even in the ayah, God encompasses all. Remember he said, uh, they do not encompass anything, it's because he encompasses all of them. So even the way it's organized, Allah encompasses everything. Like you're surrounded in your knowledge and you're literally surrounded in the ayah, you and I, because we're mentioned in the middle. Do you see that? SubhanAllah, that's, that's how do you, a human being cannot think at these levels. I, I found one more, but I literally found it half an hour ago, so I couldn't put it in the PowerPoint because I was literally just doing a last minute review. Ah, oh, do I even have time? What time is it? 12.10? Okay, I'll do it. One by one, I, I couldn't put it here, so forgive me, I literally, I literally just found this thing, subhanAllah, so listen. If you pay attention to the first entity being referred to in each of the lines, by first entity, I mean, for example, who's the first thing being mentioned in A? Who's he? Allah. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna invoke the Arabic here a little bit, so, so just pay attention. So who's the first one being mentioned in A? Allah. What is the first thing being talked about in B? لا يأخذه is the sleep. So was Allah the first thing being mentioned in B? No, sleep is. So you have Allah is the first, here Allah is not the first. In C, لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ Who's who? Who's he? Allah. So it's Allah, something else, Allah. Who can intercede? مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي Who? Is that talking about Allah? No. So you have Allah, not Allah, Allah, uh, not Allah. In E, who knows? Or he knows, I'm sorry. Who is that? Allah. And if you continue that to the end, you have a pattern of Allah is the first mention, second mention, first mention, second mention, first, second, first, second, first. Yani one of these things, just one of them by themselves is impressive. To include all of them at the same time with, by the way, maintaining a perfect message of Tawheed that philosophically you cannot break. Even the message itself is impenetrable. The argument then becomes, again, if you are of the camp that some, a man spoke this, you have a lot of questions coming your way. Because how does this happen? I don't like the word, well, I'm gonna get to that in a second. So what we're talking about actually, and here's a last look at this. I'm gonna present now, what is this concept we're talking about? What was the thing you just saw here? This is called ring structure in the Quran. Ring structure, it basically looks like this, where you see, for example, as we were saw A, B, C, D, C, B, A, yeah? And everything kind of comes circling around the middle and the end returns to the beginning. You see how that works? So this is why I drew it like this. So you see that the way that someone mentioned it was that like it repeats because it does kind of repeat, it goes back to the same message. And then the middle becomes the central meaning. So it's not just beautiful, it has a purpose. For example, what now is the central meaning of kursi? Allah's knowledge encompasses you entirely and you encompass nothing. That becomes the central message of kursi because of ring structures, subhanAllah. You ready for one more example? Yeah? Who memorized Ayat al-Nur here? Yeah, it's probably a little bit less people. Okay, Ayat al-Nur. Who's familiar with Ayat al-Nur? Raise your hand. Allahu nur samawati wa ard mathal nurihi. It's a very philosophical, very deep. We've been spending over a thousand years trying to get benefit out of this ayah. 
and we got a lot of stuff to panel up. One day we will actually only talk about this, and it's, this is life changing. This I cannot wait to talk about this. I'm not going to read it through like I did with Gursi. The basic premise is Allah is giving an example. He's saying that He's the light of the heavens and the earth, and an example of His light is like a lamp that's lit by oil. Then the oil is so bright by itself that it's all, it looks like it's on fire already. How how bright the lamp, the oil in the lantern is. And really he's not talking about a lantern or oil or a fire, he's talking about the light where? In your chest. And how Allah puts a light in the chest of every human being, and when that light meets the light of Qur'an, it's like this spiritual chemical reaction that we that Qur'an calls nurun ala nur. Have you heard nurun ala nur before? Light upon light, that's what that's referring to. Nurun ala nur, yeah? If you break this apart, I'm just gonna break it now, so to prepare for it. This is also a ring structure. So if we, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll color code it, ignore the boxes. Actually, I'm not gonna give you that yet. If we do look at A and A prime, God is the light of the heavens and the earth. And then A prime, God guides to his light, whomever he wills. So what do these have in common? Allah mentioning his light. Does that make sense? But actually, if you think about it, A, light of the heavens and the earth is talking about physical light, like the sun, for example. He illuminates physically the heavens and the earth. Whereas A prime, guidance, what kind of light is that? Physical light or spiritual light? Spiritual. So you have this spiritual light being talked about in A, I'm sorry, physical in A and spiritual in A prime. All of Allah's light surrounding the entire ayah, first of all, yeah? Then you have B, which actually gives the example of this lantern. And then B prime, light upon light. Yeah, and these are connected because that's what this is referring to, is that lantern in the chest of someone, when, uh, when Quran hits it, it explodes with this light. So it's furthering that example. Then you have C, the lantern is lit from a blessed olive tree. And it's oil almost radiates even though a fire had not touched it, meaning the oil from the tree is already super bright by itself. And those two are juxtaposed against each other. And in the middle you have neither of the east nor of the west. And what does that mean? Why is that the central idea of this? It's because we know that this light that Allah gave us is not of this world to say it's from the eastern or the western. It's from somewhere completely different. It's saying that the spirit of the human being is from who? It's from Allah. And that's what makes it the central theme, subhanAllah. That's what makes the light undying in every person. But this is also, you guys seeing the structure? You guys still with me? You seeing the structure here? All interconnected. Now these are two examples of ayahs. What about a full surah? Does this work on the surah level? And I will preface this by saying every surah should be given its own right. Every surah has its own stuff going on. But this does in fact work on the surah level on many occasions. I'm gonna share uh, four. First two are gonna be small surahs. We're gonna do one and then I'm gonna give you a break, okay? So here's the first small surah. Who memorized Qariya? Al-Qariya, Mal-Qariya, wa madara qariya Good, good amount of you. That's why I picked this one. Okay, this, is, this one is talking about judgment day both the scene of Judgment Day and the result of Judgment Day. And there's almost a level of horror actually in this ayah, in the surah, I'm sorry, because it brings up topics that it doesn't actually conclude. For example, it says Al-Qariya, the crashing blow, and what will make you understand what this thing is, and it doesn't answer that question. It gives a hypothetical and doesn't answer it. You know, like in a horror movie, for example, when you find out the villain, it becomes less scary. Like you ever watch Insidious? It was super scary, and then you found out the villain was like a Darth Maul looking guy, and you're like, that's, from Star Wars, and you're like, that's not, very, that's not very scary. So Allah leaves this element of unknown to keep this fear in the surah. Does that make sense? When you break this apart, here's what it would look like. You have two events, and pay attention with me here. I'm gonna to point to what I want you to pay attention to. Two events of the afterlife are an A and A prime. Al-Qari'ah, the crashing blow, meaning like the, the, the start of the event, yeah? And Narun Hamiya, which is also, which of course, is referring to what? It's referring to hell in the afterlife. And they even rhyme, by the way, Al Qari'a, Narun Hamiya, end in the same sound, and they rhyme as well. B, both B's, B and B prime, talk about this hypothetical and what will make you understand what Qari'a is and what will make you understand what the abyss is, the abyss mentioned in this ayah. So you have two events. Two hypotheticals, and in the middle you have these long things that actually both have parallelism in it. What does that mean? On a day where people will be scattered moths and mountains like carded wool. You see, A will be B and A will be B. And over here, same thing. 
When the good deeds are heavy, pleasant life. When the good deeds are light, their home will be the abyss. So both are themed against each other. Why? Because they both have this parallelism. A will become B. A will become B. And again, A to B, A to B. Does that make sense? Now, if you split this surah in the middle, this is interesting. Because you can, this is an amazing thing about this stuff, guys. Man, I need to shut up, but I have to give you an example. Quran at some point compares itself to the stars. And the point of that is like the more you, you ever like look at the stars and then like five minutes later, you're like, whoa. Like it takes you a while to see stuff and to really think about it. Well, like Quran does the same stuff, the same thing. Where the more you look at it, the more stuff that you find. So the more you look at this, actually you can split it immediately in half. And everything from A to C is talking about what the judgment day looks like. And everything from C prime to A prime, C to A down here, is talking about the result of judgment day. When you split it down the middle. So it goes from this terrifying short excerpt about what you're going to see to a sh terrifying short excerpt of what, the judge, of what the result is. Does that make sense? Are you guys following me here? SubhanAllah. It's just so symmetrical. Again, the question becomes, challenging back to we have two options. Option A, it comes from who? Allah. Option B, it's what? Just spoken from this man, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That option B, again, you would have to question that claim with basically, how does someone think at this level without writing it down first, without you know, amending something? How does one think at this level? and think in this parallel form. We're gonna take a small break. What I wanna do is this. We're gonna talk, this is our biggest example. This is actually a whole page, Buruj. Buruj is especially relevant in our times right now. I'm gonna give you five to 10 minutes. If you wanna tackle this on your own, go ahead, take the five, 10 minutes and tackle it on your own. But if you wanna also, if you wanna ask questions or if you wanna take a break and go get some food, you do that for the next five or 10 minutes, inshallah, okay? So either one of three things, go get food or chill, try to do this on your own and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it in five minutes. Or if you want, you can ask questions, inshallah. So I'll leave it up to you guys. This one now. You all ready? <clears throat> what are we? Buruj, yes. The second small Suda example. We have three more left to go through. I'm going to quickly go over this one because I like actually the last two more, okay? Did anyone actually look and try to do this? Did anyone actually try? <laughs> Someone said no on behalf of everybody. <laughs> well, I believe you. Okay, so I'm gonna just split this up. The next screen is just gonna be what it is. We can, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. You'll just go ahead and stare and appreciate it. I'm gonna call it a few things though, okay? So Bismillah. And by the way, I chose this again because, you know, so far we're dealing with not very huge bodies of literature, yeah? They're not that big. There are a couple sentences. Short, short, you know, they're short sentences, basically. But this, Although it's like a quote unquote small surah because it's just a page, this is a lot for it to follow the same rules. But in fact, it does. In fact, it does. And I'm just gonna call out a few things. And again, guys, the idea is not that sentences match or even ayahs match. The idea is that themes match. Maybe a theme is an ayah by itself. Maybe a theme is two ayahs or three ayahs or four or five, six or 10. But the idea is when a theme switches, pay attention to that theme switch. And I really sincerely, I challenge you, try to look for these on your own. I found them by myself last year and it is one of the best experiences of my life, Allah. So try your best to reflect on God on like this. Anyway, if we even look at A over here, the A got cut off for some reason, but we have by the heaven containing the celestial fortress, meaning that there's Buruj up in the sky, yeah? On the bottom, on A prime, this is a majestic Quran in a guarded heavenly tablet. What's the purpose of a fort? to guard something. What's being guarded? Quran in Lawh al-Mahfud. You see the connection? B, by the promised day and by the witness and the witnessed, be prime while God is encompassing them from behind, meaning the disbelievers. When does God officially encompass them from behind physically? The day of judgment. The same day he mentioned in B. You following? On C, Cursed be the companions of the trench, the fire, meaning when they threw Muslims in the trench and burned them alive and sat there watching them. C prime, similar disbelievers that did similar things. Pharaoh and Thamud, indeed those who disbelieve are in denial. And that takdeeb was reflected here with the people of the trench and here with Pharaoh and Thamud. You see that connection? D, while, we, while they were witness over what they did, the word here is yafaluna. 
fa'ala. Pay attention to that, yeah? And on D, the doer, fa'alun, lima yuri. Do you hear that? Even like the, the assonance of it, the, the sound of it. Yaf'aluna and fa'al, do you hear that? The same verb was used. The same verbs. He could have said amal. He could have here said ya'maluna. There's so many words for the word to do in Arabic. But he picked these two because it completes the cycle. SubhanAllah. And by the way, I remind you again, anchors, yes? When you see even the same word being repeated in Quran, the same verb being repeated, there is something necessarily going on there. You understand? Those are anchors. Maybe you'll find a structure or maybe you just find a connection. But pay attention to that. Do I need to continue? Do you get the idea? I'm going to skip to the central theme. Those who believe and do righteous deeds, for them are gardens underneath which rivers flow. That is the great victory. This whole surah is a love letter to believers who get tortured to death. This is why I actually loved it in this time with Gaza. I have I've clung on to this ever since the bombing started, the surah. And it just it, it should warm your heart that even the center of this love letter to believers that Allah is in full control. That Allah will punish believer, that disbelievers who kill Muslims for no other reason other than the fact that they're Muslims. And that he does love the believers despite their physical reality. The heart of the surah becomes, I take care of believers, even the ones that are tortured. SubhanAllah. Again, with ring structure, the meaning is in the middle. You understand? So everything around here is just a supporting argument for what? The middle. You've written essays. You're told in essays you have to have a thesis. And every paragraph has to support that what? That thesis. The thesis in Quran becomes the middle of a ring structure. And everything surrounding it supports that thesis. Does that make sense? Make sense? Okay. We're going to go into medium-sized surahs now. I'm going to define medium loosely as like 10 pages, 15 pages, whatever. Like, uh, bigger than small surahs. Medium is just bigger than small. That's, that's my... That's my determination. We're going to start with Surah Yusuf. Thank you for being the only one laughing at that joke. Thanks so much. Okay. Medium, medium Surah example number one. We're going to go through two. And then I think we have to... Oh yeah, we're running out of time. Time's it. Okay. So we're going to go through this one first. This one is really interesting. Obviously, Yusuf is a famous Surah. It's loved by Muslims because, you know, uh, even Yusuf, it's argued that Yusuf, the name comes from Asafa, which means to be sad. And a lot of Muslims see Surah Yusuf as like this cureness for... Sadness, because the whole story is about a young boy who's sad, grows up to be a man who's sad, and how that sadness got alleviated. Basically, if you want to summarize it psychologically, that's how you'd summarize it. You make sense? So we all know the story of Yusuf. Yeah, we're familiar with the story of Yusuf, all the problems that he had, all the solutions that came up. And this, by the way, again, I remind you, this is a sizable surah. It's like, I, th I think at least 10 pages, right? Someone correct me if I'm wrong. It's at least 10 pages long, if not exactly 10 pages long. So does ring structure apply to this much bigger suda than what we've seen so far. In fact, it does, and I want to show it to you. Um, let me take one at a time, so please look at me. I know you guys are probably digging into it, but listen. It starts with a prologue of Allah introducing the Quran and, uh, and the story, okay? Then you'll notice B through F are all problems that occur. And notice, by the way, again, this idea of a theme not being an ayah. I put the verse numbers here so you can check it yourself also if you want to. But these all make up one theme. So it's like this happened and then another theme happens. And Does that make sense? So there's a group of ayahs and a group of ayahs. Anyway, so B, Yusuf's first problem at ASM is the vision of him seeing the, t the 11 stars, the sun and the moon. By the way, uh, just real quick, kind of weird how, how many parts is this? 12. And it's surah number... 12, and how many brothers, how many sons of Yaqub? So anyway, that's a little tidbit, but moving on. Jo Yusuf, the next problem, Yusuf alayhi salam disputes with his brothers and the plot of the brothers towards Yusuf. The plot, was the plot? What is the, the plan against him? Throw him in the well, yeah, famously. Next one, Yusuf alayhi salam's relative promotion. What do I mean by relative promotion? He sold as a slave. He's bargained goods, and then he kind of gets a little if you want to call it a promotion in life, where now he's a servant of the Aziz, of the, of the counselor of Egypt of, at the time, okay? Not much of a solution, it's still part of the problem, yeah? And then the attempted seduction of Yusuf salam by the Aziz's wife. And after that, Yusuf salam is framed for something he didn't do. So he's just no luck in Yusuf salam's beginning half of his life. He's thrown in prison, and then two prisoners come in, and he interprets their dream. 
And this is where, uh, and he actually introduces himself as the prophet of monotheism while he's sitting in a cell with these two men that don't believe. Does that make sense? Then the next half of the surah are all the solutions. So you'll notice it's every single one of them is matched with the solution of the original problem. <laughs> come, I mean, come on, guys. come on. Okay, let's look at F. Yusuf was in prison, or actually he, uh, uh, yeah, he's in prison, interpreter of the vision of the king meaning he first solves the problem of the king of Egypt at the time. That I have this dream, I'm worried about it, of like a famine coming. And he interprets the dream. The next one, the, the outcome of women's seduction, meaning that Aziz's wife openly admits he never touched me. And I'm the one that wronged him. So he gets freed from prison. That's what I mean by rehabilitated. Yusuf A.S. definitive promotion, meaning he was promoted from a slave to a servant. Now he's promoted from a prisoner to what? The right hand man of the king. That's a real definitive promotion now. Next, Yusuf Sanam, they plotted against him first, so then he plotted against them in the second half. Remember, he hid the goods and made it look like they stole something? So he can get them back and get his father back in the, in the, in the throne room. And then the fulfillment of the vision that we saw in the beginning of the surah. Because when they all came to pay respects, he told his father, Abiti, like, this is what I saw when I was a kid. That my brothers and my mother and father are all here to pay respect to me. And then it's the epilogue. Closing the same way that it begun. SubhanAllah. Uh, but but hold, we're not done with Yusuf yet. Listen, I want to focus on this one. On F. In F, there's another ring structure. So now we're getting a ring structure within a ring structure. Let's zoom in on F, on Ayahs 35 to 42. 35 to 37, actually, let me just explain it by A and A prime. On A, Yusuf promises to interpret the dream of his prison mates. And by the end of this section, he interprets the dreams of the prison mates. Two ayahs, two ayahs, or three ayahs, three and two. On B, B and B prime are actually everything here, from B to B prime, including C, are all his speech. But even his speech is a ring. <laughs> Even a speech is a ring. So it starts off by saying, I'm just going to go key words. My father is Abraham and Isaac. It was not appropriate for us to associate anything with God. That is from God's favor upon us, upon mankind. But most of mankind are not grateful. Pay attention to this one. Over here, you do not worship besides him, but names that you have named you and your fathers. So my fathers worship one God, your fathers worship many. The parallelism, you see it? For which God has not, not sent, uh, sent down authority. The decision is with Allah. He commands that you do not worship other than Him. That is the upright religion, but most of mankind do not know. Mankind are not grateful. Mankind do not know. You see the anchor? You see that? Mankind are not grateful. Mankind do not know. So if you paid attention to the mankind part, whatever, if you paid attention to that, you would have found this. And in the very center, which this is arguable that this is now the center of not just this section, but the entire of Surah Yusuf, right? You guys seeing that? Because where do we pluck this from? From the middle. So you can argue this is not just the center of section F, but the center of the whole thing. My true prison mates are diverse lords better or God, the one, the mighty. So Tawheed becomes even the gummy center of the candy that is Surah Yusuf, is the oneness of Allah. Reiterated, SubhanAllah. That's SubhanAllah, that's amazing. Any questions on Yusuf? I want to give one more example, then I'm going to let you guys go. Any, any questions about this? Does this one make sense? Head nods? Yeah? Good? Good. Okay, Bismillah. The last one I want to talk to you about, this one's going to be cool, is Surah Rahman. This is the last one, so pay attention. Surah Rahman, you can divide into five sections. Five sections. So we're going to look at the five sections of Rahman. It starts off by actually talking about God taught the Quran. Ar-Rahman, Allama, Al-Quran. We were just talking about that one. Then from 3 to 36, it goes on about Allah's creation. Ashamsu wa najmu bi husban. And he's talking about Allah's creations, all the physical creations. Part three, it talks about criminals that end up in hell. And it describes the scene of judgment day that they see and the result that they see also being hell. Yeah. Then from 46 to 61, pay attention to the ayahs, please. The ayah count, okay? Um, you see rewards for the believers being paradise. You see that for section four? So it's juxtaposed against number three of, of people of hell, now it's people of Jannah. And then it closes off by, it's basically paradise plus, the paradise VIP plan of very special believers. Does that make sense? So it contrasts actually. 
Uh, and even the language, I don't have time to go into it, but the language even kind of almost resets the topic, but adds extra language to, to show that it is actually like extra Jannah, yeah? So believers and special believers. Jannah, super Jannah. Jannah, VIP Jannah, whatever you want to say it. Paradise and Paradise Plus, yeah? Oh, actually, that's not much of a ring structure, is it? Maybe if we compare it to the next surah. Let's compare Rahman to Waqiyah. Because this isn't by itself, yeah? You guys see that's not a ring structure yet. Let's compare it to the next surah, similar in size, similar in themes. Waqiyah starts, uh, guess how many parts in Waqiyah, by the way? Rahman has five. How many do you think Waqiyah has? Seven. Stick with me. I know. Stick with me. Waqiyah has seven. It starts off with, these, with this intro of three groups. Okay, these three groups are, who knows Waqiyah? Who are the three groups in the beginning of Waqiyah that it describes? Thank you very much, yeah. So people of the right hand, meaning believers. People, and by what do I mean by people of the right and left? People that catch their book of deeds and the right one is given to them, or they're handed to it on their left hand. That's one of the first signs of judgment day that you know where you stand. If you catch it on your right, you're happy. If you catch it on your left, then you're basically doomed. Yes, we understand this. And then there's a third group, there's only two hands. The third group is a sabiqu and a sabiqu, people who that excelled way even past believers. Does that make sense? So they're super right hand, if you whatever you want to call them, they're excellers. Anyway, it introduces the three groups. Then the first part after this introduction, so first part of the introduction, the ones who excelled, okay? So it talks about these sabiqun in more detail. What, what Jannah do they get? Then it talks about people of the right and what Jannah do they get, yeah? Then it talks about people of the left hand, the people that ended up in hell and what punishment do they get? Then it talks about Allah's creation. Who was in my class, Huda, Hanan? Do you remember that video I sent? Of, you didn't watch it, did you? Never mind, I get it. Well, I'm like, sorry, my old students, man, disappoint me every day. Okay, anyway, God's creation. I someday want to show you what I found about this part by itself. I love this part. Anyway, part four is what? God's creation. And the last, not sorry, not last part. The last of these five actually ends with the majesty of the Quran. And then there's an outro that reaffirms the three groups. So if you set aside, well, anyway, so you have seven parts with the five with an intro and an outro. I want to show you something. I'm going to color code it, okay? with magic. You'll notice that the first part of Rahman matches with what? The last part of Waqiyah. God taught the Quran and Waqiyah ends with the majesty of the Quran. You see that? The second part of Rahman is God's creation. The second to last part of Waqiyah is what? God's creation. The middle of both are people that end up in hell, people that are of the people of the left. The fourth part of Rahman is a reward for believers. The second part is people of the right hand. Number five ends with this paradise plus VIP plan that they earned. And number and the first one over here is the ones who excelled, the people that got extra reward for being people that excelled. You see how Rahman and Waqiyah by themselves are not parallel, but when you put them together. You know how Allah says, for example, in the physical reality, we created things in pairs. Even surahs are in pairs. The more you look at Quran, the more you look and try to find stuff, Allah just gives you and gives you and gives you and gives you. You can find these moments on your own. Let me summarize what we talked about today because that was the last example. I'll leave it open for questions or whatever you guys want to talk about or if you want to just end it. But basically what we talked about today, we opened the conversation of Allah's miracles and I want to talk about the word miracle really fast, okay? I don't like using that word. When scholars talk about the quote-unquote miracles of Qur'an, they don't say the word ayatul Qur'an, they don't use the English word miracle. They use a bunch of words, but my favorite word they use is a mu'jiz. Anyone heard this word before, mu'jiz al-Qur'an? Mu'jiz is a really interesting word. A mu'jiz, I want, I want to paint a scene for you to help you understand what that means. If me and you are sword fighting, me and another person, we're sword fighting, yeah? And he gets me in a really vulnerable position where he knocks a sword out of my hand and I'm on, on my knees and he points the sword at me. What am I going to do? I'm going to say, I give up. You overpowered me. Does that make sense? In that situation, the one holding the sword is called a mu'jiz and the one on the ground is called a mu'jaz. Meaning the one who overpowered and the one who was overpowered. Does that make sense? When you, because Quran is an intellectual battle against anyone that doesn't want to believe. 
It's an intellectual battle. You now, when someone wants to deny Quran and they experience this at some point, for me at least, I'm like, Ya Allah, I, I get it. I'm Mu'ajaz and you're the Mu'ajaz. I believe, I get it. Does that make sense? Quran constantly throws things at you to completely unarm you, disarm you mentally, disarm you intellectually to the point where it becomes so difficult to argue that a man did this. Make sense? So mu'ajiz, I love that word because truly it does overpower in the mind. It overpowers your mind, overpowers your heart. And that's what we're seeing on TikTok, by the way. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing the mu'ajiz affect the hearts of humanity. Inshallah affects our hearts too. Next week, here's what we're gonna do. We talked about ayahs, two ayahs, yeah? I gave you two ayah examples. I gave you two small surah examples, two medium surah examples. But then what's a question should be on everyone's mind? Yeah, what about, what about Baqarah? Does that do that too? Baqarah is a very big surah, it's the biggest surah. How many pages? Baqarah takes like two hours just to recite. <laughs> it's a very big surah. The second chapter. Does, it, does that do this too? To what extent, actually even the whole book, does the whole book do this? How far can we take this? We'll answer that question next week. Okay, next week we'll be continuing this, but looking at, we're gonna really zoom out. Let's look at everything. I might even throw Fatiha in there too, actually. Okay, and we'll look at this together. Your homework for next week, from now on, I'm actually gonna give you stuff to do if you really wanna benefit. Just read Baqarah, just read the English of it. Just read it, it'll take you like half an hour. Or just listen to an English translation of it, but just read it, come back next week, we'll explore it together. May Allah reward you guys, thank you so much for coming. I'm gonna end it here, but I'm gonna open for questions. Does anyone have any questions?